Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to think for a moment <clears throat> what you would consider the most famous financial gift of all times. Now, if you ever heard of Bill Gates, you might point to the Gates Foundation that has given away $50 billion over 30 years. But you'd be wrong. Or if you've got connections in New York, maybe you would think about all the things the Rockefellers have done. Or if you went to a show at Carnegie Hall, maybe you'd think Andrew Carnegie, and you'd be wrong. If you're thinking more local here in Charlotte, certainly the Levines have a lot of names and a lot of buildings. They've done tremendous things for Charlotte with their generosity. But still, you'd be wrong. I think the most famous financial gift ever given is from Luke chapter 21 in a story that is often called the widow's might. And I say that because with 2.4 billion Christians alive today, and probably that many as well who have died, we've got most Christians at some point will have heard that story or at least heard that phrase about the widow's might, which makes it the most famous of all financial gifts ever. Now, before the text gets into the actual gift, Jesus is in the uh, temple area, in the courtyard, where people are coming and going. It's kind of a congestion. And as he's there with his disciples, he says these words, Beware of the teachers of the law. Beware of the teachers of the law. that They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats of the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. Beware. Beware of what he's saying is the church leaders or religious leaders. And why is that so? I mean, of all the different professions, why beware of the religious leaders? I bet if I were to pass around a microphone here, we could spend the next two hours talking about substantial stories to back up Jesus' warning about religious leaders. Religious leaders have positions of authority, of power, speaking on behalf of God, which is ripe for opening up the doors for abuse and misleading of God's people. I mean, you can just think of a couple of examples. Right here in Charlotte with PTL and the Bakers and a $4,000 doghouse with air conditioning. Or you can think about in the Roman Catholic Church all the abuse going on with children for decades that was covered up, just leaving a wake of destruction behind it. You can point to some cult leaders who have taken God's people away under the guise of Christianity and done unspeakable things. David Koresh in Waco, Texas, Jim Jones in Guyana, Africa. Some pastors using the, the generous gift of the flock to buy extravagant things, even airplanes. Or some pastors you know, running the church as if it's their private business and their CEO and chairman of the board and president all wrapped up as one. Oh, we could go around. <clears throat> we could hear story after story experiences that would substantiate Jesus' warning. But it's not the scandals that he points to. It's the self-promotion. 
It's the self-worth. These are the ones who love to be greeted in the marketplace, to be recognized by others. These are the ones that will sit at the head table with the heavy hitters during the, during the fundraiser. These are the ones that have access to exclusive properties. These are the ones who sit with the owner in the owner's box at the game. Beware. Beware. And of course, this is not limited to just the clergy. In all the different disciplines and areas, we figured out how to create a pecking order, haven't we? So in business, you'll have a manager and, a, and then a, a director and an executive and a chairman. In the military, how many bars or stripes or eagles or stars do you have? Who do I salute? The universities. Are you an instructor, an assistant professor, an associate, or a full professor? See, we figure out pretty quickly what the pecking order is. Even in medicine, think about you know, my, my son in residency right now. You figure out pretty quickly which doc has the long white coat that your little short white coat has to bow down and grovel to for five years. They figure it out pretty quickly. But going beyond just the self-promotion, there's also something that Jesus warns against. The very next phrase, he says, they devour widows' houses. They devour widows' houses. Make a show of lengthy prayers. These men will be severely punished most severely. They devour widows' houses. The widow is that emblem, is that symbol of the person that's most vulnerable particularly in the first century. There's no social security. There's no safety net. The widow is often at the mercy of whomever might help out. And so, you know, for centuries, the widow has been the target of so many schemes it's the financial planner that says, give me all your money and I'll give you a huge return. It's the organization that says, make a big investment here and I will promise you companionship to assuage your loneliness. It's the pastor who bilks the widow out of her savings, promising her a place in the kingdom of God. Oh, beware. Beware, he says. It's in that backdrop that we turn into Luke 21, in which Jesus is still in the courtyard, still at the temple, but he notices something going on. And he says to his disciples this, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, which is a good thing, right? They're sharing, they're, they're giving, they're... Except, in the temple, there are like 13 receptacles. And they weren't like a cloth bag. They weren't like a wooden trunk. They were um, a receptacle, but on top, there was this large metal bell, almost like a trumpet, a big opening. I suppose for some to, you know, take shots at and see if they can score, but probably not. I think the primary reason is what? It amplifies the sound. So when you put a little in there, everybody around you will know. And when you put in a lot, it'll get everybody's attention. And he saw the rich coming. While the place was crowded, putting in their putting in their offering and wondering, do you notice? Did you hear? That's a lot, right? But something else goes on here. The widows, the ones who have this measly offering, the ones who are probably waiting for the crowd to dissipate 
where they can creep up to one of these receptacles and place in there their measly offering. And as that happened, it says this, Jesus also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Copper. Like our cents. And from this text, this is where we get that phrase, can I give you my two cents? Which means not much. Let me give you just a little bit. Just my two cents. Now, it says two coins. Um, if you read the, the King James Version, it says a mite. It is a mite, which is the smallest of all the coins that are minted. And how much is a mite? <clears throat> a mite is one thirty seconds of a denarii. Does that help? <laughs> of course, a denarii is what the average laborer makes in one day. So if I'm doing the math right, you put two in, it equals about less than 30 minutes for a single day. In other words, it's not much, is it? It's not much. And Jesus, pointing this out with his disciples, he could have been appalled. He could have been embarrassed for her. He could have said, no, 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 keep, keep your money. You're going to need it. But instead, he turns to his disciples and says this. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Let's stop there a second. Really? Do the math, Jesus. It's two 30 seconds or one sixteenth of a one day. It's not much. It's not even a rounding error. They're not going to change the budget with her gift. They're not going to put a plaque with her name on it anywhere. They're not going to add an addition onto the, onto the temple. Do the math, Jesus. This is not more than everyone else gave. And then he gives the explanation why he said this. He says this. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. The rich, with lots of noise, echoing out. They had money to spare. Uh, their lifestyle <clears throat> probably wouldn't change. Who knows if they even missed it. But for her, this changed everything. She felt it. She'd have to change her life. That's why it was more. <clears throat> so I'll say that even, even the gates, as generous as they have been, as committed to giving away the money, $50 billion over 30 years, you know that their portfolio has grown and exceeded more of that in those 30 years. So they're not down anything. Their, their lifestyle has not diminished one bit. That's why Jesus says this is giving it all in a word of praise. But the world, the world would say, you foolish woman. This is all you have left and you're putting it into the coffers there? How are you going to live? Who's going to take care of you? If you've ever had to make a tough decision, whether to take this job or that job, move to this city or that city, um, you know, uh, buy this car or that car, date this person or that person, whatever. Have you ever made two columns? The pro and the con and just kind of see how they, how they balanced out a little bit. So I did that this, this week, and what were the cons? Why shouldn't this woman put any of her money into, into that bell? First one I thought about was, it's not much, really. They're not even going to notice it. Whether you give it or don't give it, it's not 
that much. Just keep it. You're not making an impact. Or number two, uh, if it's all she had, well, now what? Now you become a burden on society. Now you beg on the streets. Maybe you go to your family. you got to take care of yourself. Or you're just going to create this whole dependency culture. How about some independence? Take care of yourself. Third one, we don't expect it. You know, I know we're doing a capital campaign here. I know I'm talking to everybody. I know I'm handing out pledge cards, but really, we're not talking to you, honey. It, you know, don't, don't, you just tear that up. You just tear that up because um, we're not expecting anything from you, just from the ones who can afford it. Or the fourth one, she's the victim. Her house has been devoured. Maybe her husband was killed. Her children are gone. Don't, don't turn you into a, a hero here. You're the victim. It is you that we need to take care of. It is you who deserve to receive, not to give. Or maybe the fourth one, others have so much more. Others have so much more. Let them put it in. We'll give you a pass. There's a lot of reasons on that con side, isn't there? So then I went to the pro side. What a reason that she should give. And I really struggled here. Because I, I came up with some suggestions, but that, it wasn't the right one. For instance, um, not so that you feel good. I mean, that's not the reason because, boy, those feelings leave in a short period of time and now you're penniless. So you don't do it just because it feels really good. You don't do it because you're commanded to. People can make you do it, but that's not the right motivation. Um, oh, nor is the second one, the guilt. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we should give with a cheerful heart. A cheerful heart, not out of coercion, not out of command, but a cheerful heart. In fact, the Greek word there is um, hilarious. You should laugh yourself silly as you're going up to the offering plate. I want to hear that during the offering today. <laughs> Laughing yourself silly, the hilarity, not guilt. The next one, an investment. Boy, haven't you heard this at times? <clears throat> People say, um, you know, my, my company was going bankrupt, my kids were on drugs, my, my spouse and the relationship was on the rocks, I started to tithe. And my company took off, my kids are great, and the relationship is on track. When we give, it's, it's not an investment in ourselves. If I give God this much, I will get this much back. It's not the way it works. So it can't be an investment either. It's not like she's putting in those two mites and hoping for, you know, a whole talent to come back. The only one I could think of was, next one here, Hineni. That was the only one I could think of. And if you're visiting with us today, you may not know that word. It's Christ Lutheran's word for the year. A Hebrew word that means here I am. And not like, here I am, I'm present, but here I am, here I am to be committed, to be faithful, to stand in the gap. Here I am, the answer's yes before you even had to ask. Hineni. And so we talked about worship, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a whole lot of cons. There's a whole lot of reasons why I shouldn't be going to worship on Sunday morning. It's early in the morning, it's the only day I have off, the sermons are too short, there, this is so many reasons. But there's only reason, one reason on the pro column. And the pro column is Hineni. Here I am to worship. The most important thing we do. Oh, we talked about forgiving. Whole lot of reasons on the con side. You know, they didn't show enough re remorse. I don't forgive because it gets them off the hook. I don't forgive, I get revenge. And there's only one on the pro side, Hineni. I forgive because I have been forgiven. 
Same thing with serving. We talked about that last night or last week. There's a lot of reasons why we don't serve. You know, time, toxic charity, whatever else. Only reason to serve. If we want to emulate Jesus, he's the one who said, I came not to be served, but to serve. Hineni, here I am to serve. And now today, to give. Here I am to give. And I suppose we could add to that whole long list of why we shouldn't, or maybe we should cut back, you know. Uh, I've got college, I've got a wedding, I've got retirement, I've got a house, I've got, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons. But in the end, it's not because of pride or guilt or command or recognition or taxes. <laughs> it really gets down to that word, hineni. And the giving to understand that it is from a grateful, hilarious heart that's overwhelmed by the blessings that God showers upon me, <clears throat> more than I can count, certainly more than I deserve. And with that, I laugh all the way to the plate. And the interesting thing, I think, is that the very next chapter, Luke 22, do you know what happens? Jesus is arrested. He's put on a mock trial. He's beaten within an inch of his life. He's nailed on a cross. In other words, Jesus doesn't just talk a good line about this widow giving everything. On the cross, he does the same. He gives it all leaving nothing behind, completely all in, all committed, all giving. To God, to be sure, but also to you and me. So I would go back to my original question. You know, what's the most famous financial gift in the whole world? And I'll just amend it slightly. I still stand by the widow's might is probably known more than any other gift ever given. But the most famous gift, period, of all times has got to be the cross in which Jesus was all in, in which he left nothing behind. It was this body broken and this blood shed for you. And that has to be the most famous gift ever. Don't you think? Thanks be to God. Amen.